mainstream academia seems to downplay the miraculous nature of the Bible. You have this very deep area here, and you have this deep area here, but at, at Nueva, that's a walkable area. Uh, <laughs> I guess that the presence of God just entered your studio. <laughs> Where did they cross? Today, we're going to talk about one of the biggest and most foundational miracles of the Bible. That is the Israelites crossing of the Red Sea. So without any further ado, I'm going to introduce to you now, Mr. Andrew Jones. Andrew. Hey, Pastor AJ. Nice to be back. Thank you for having me. So I think we've all heard at this point how, you know, mainstream academia seems to downplay the miraculous nature of the Bible, and some of that plays into what we're going to talk about today, but uh, what some may not realize is that, that there are different views on where the location of the Red Sea crossing, yes, I said the Red Sea crossing might have been this, this pivotal foundational miracle of the Bible. And if, if you're an evangelical Christian and you're somebody who wants to take a literal view of the scriptures, obviously this is, this is an important thing. It's a big deal because you might hear out there in the world that, that there's just no evidence for it. Um, you, you've also got some people sort of, I don't want to say on the traditional end of the spectrum, because if, if you go back far enough, traditional, people saw, people believed in the Bible and they believed that this was a literal event. Others, though, have actually taken a, a different view of it. You had told me there was a recent article that came out. Can you kind of tell us a little bit about that article and where some of the people who don't see a um, uh, kind of a large-scale miracle taking place here say that the Israelites crossed? Yeah, they had an article uh, in the British press, and I think other um, news sources picked it up, uh, it was actually about a March uh, 2023 study that was published in one of the scholarly journals, but it was about uh, the study that showed the possibility that the Red Sea was uh, due to a meteorological event, they say, uh, something due to weather um, and not because of God's power. Um, so they took out the supernatural part, which I find interesting because, uh, you know, it, based on what the Bible says, the Red Sea split because God told Moses, you know, stretch your staff out, you know, your, your arm. And then he told the Israelites to move forward into the sea. Uh, so I don't know how uh, a natural event could happen just at the perfect timing. But, it, you know, everything's possible. Uh, but anyways, that was what the article was based on. That kind of got you and I talking about uh, this topic. Uh, and I know you've been on my uh, uh, tours out there, so you've seen these sites too, some of the exact same sites that these articles uh, are talking about. And even this, uh, another site that we're actually proposing as a better place for a large scale miracle at the Nueva Red Sea Crossing. Yeah, I do. Um, I actually have a little bit of the sand from the Saudi side of, uh, of the Red Sea here. So I don't know if they're going to come looking for me, but I, I did smuggle some of that out of the country. <laughs> but um, I was on the tours with you there and uh, had actually been to the traditional Sinai and then also this uh, new proposal or what's what's become sort of a new proposal in the last uh, 50, 50 years or so. But some of these individuals will say that uh, because of this naturalistic explanation, the crossing site had to be in a different location, and that kind of makes it smaller scale. Where is that location that they say it happened, and um, w what are the problems with this particular location? Well, I, I think um, we should first look at um, where Midian was located and Mount Sinai, because that does affect uh, your thinking on the available locations for the Red Sea crossing. Um, if you if you say the Red Sea only happened, uh, the crossing only happened on the Gulf of Suez um, or one of the lakes there, uh, just north of the tip of Suez, then that means yeah, uh, you could you have the Sinai Peninsula as the nearest location for these mountains and the wilderness, and so that's why a lot of people say uh, Mount Sinai is in the traditional site or near there. Um, now, I know there's a hybrid view. There are those who say the crossing was at one of these uh, locations, but they also consider Mount Sinai to be in Arabia. So they take a, uh, like a 
a hybrid approach between the two. Uh, but a lot of people who look at a Sinai being in the land of Midian in Saudi Arabia, uh, th that then opens up the doors for th them to consider the Gulf of Aqaba, the other branch of, you know, the, the main body of the Red Sea splits, and you have this uh, eastern branch called the Gulf of Aqaba or the Gulf of Elat. Um, and along that Gulf, there is a really good location that we'll soon be looking at that, uh, that I think fits the biblical account better. Um, and it shows how big of a miracle it was that God did there. Um, yeah, like show. you just explained, there is sort of like a, um, there's like a little pie slice um, of a peninsula that's called the Sinai Peninsula. And so this, the Sinai Peninsula, I think traditionally has been seen as part of Egypt. Uh, to this day, I think it's actually part of Egypt. But if you go back in time and you look at ancient maps, the Sinai Peninsula is actually part of Egypt. It's not part of uh, modern day uh, or ancient Midian. And so, um, so this, I think this is where the problem lies. The modern day understanding of Sinai being in the Sinai Peninsula means that the Red Sea crossing had to happen kind of up to the northwest of where we would place it. And that's what a lot of people seem to think. Um, but I think it's problematic, too, because uh, there are those like David Roll, who I spoke with some time ago on this program, um, who kind of see the, the numbers of the exodus really scaled down to the thousands as opposed to potentially uh, the millions. And so it, it really alters the way we look at this miracle as a whole. And I would say there's problems with that because you can't have a group of 10,000 people inhabiting the promised land and becoming a nation in the way that the Bible clearly describes the Israelites populating an entire region. You know, I, I think also just for the, the, the fact that it was a miracle, uh, and, and I'm not opposed to naturalistic explanations, I don't think you are either, but when we do that and then we put it in this particular location, I think it gives us problems. Whereas the one that we're going to look at in a little bit seems to fit the bill better. Yeah, I, I'm not opposed to a naturalistic, like God using nature to do his miracles and his bidding. You know, he, he's the creator. So that, that's all possible. But uh, when you look at like our understanding of nature, just based on what you can observe, and like that's what a lot of scientific articles are about, right? And like they they observe something and they're gonna test it. Um, and, but that puts God in a box. Like you're basically saying, well, God had to do it this way at this location because I can explain it in this scientific article. Versus if you had it at like the Nueva site, you're talking about 800 meters of water uh, dividing, and it just blows your mind. Like how how can uh, that happen? You know, obviously, unless you're the God of the universe, you, you couldn't do it. <laughs> it yeah. would be mm -hmm. naturally impossible. Uh, so there's a mix, you know, it, it, the Bible talks about splitting the sea, you know, that's it has to be a, a process that involves physics, um, obviously, but and it talks about this eastern wind blowing. But at the same time, it also says it was a miracle. It was the deep sea, uh, mighty depths, uh, and enough water to drown uh, the armies of the Egyptians. So, um, so I think it's it's possible that you could say that oh, it's only naturalistic that you know events happen. But when you read the full biblical account, there are things you can't explain naturally, and so I think you need to open your mind up to other locations and possibilities that would uh, make it a true miracle, and I think that's what the Nueva site offers. Yeah, I'm definitely with you on this, Andrew. Why don't you walk us through why Nueva Beach is probably the site of the Red Sea crossing? Okay, well, I think if you're going to look at the proposed site of Nueva, you have to go back a number of years ago and uh, see like who started this whole thing and why are people today looking at the site. Um, of course, uh, I think the evidence is there, so you don't have to focus on a, uh, the name of a person. But at the same time, it is important to realize that uh, uh, it was because of this man, uh, I'm talking about Ron Wyatt, that uh, people go there today and are investigating it and written books about it and making movies. Um, 
And so it was back in 19, uh, I think it was 77, in the late 70s, that Ron Wyatt and his sons were investigating uh, the Gulf of Aqaba. You know, Ron had read the account of Josephus and other writers that uh, put the Red Sea at a mountainous area, uh, a wilderness area, and none of the sites he thought, the traditional sites, you know, being proposed uh, along the eastern side of the land of Egypt fit. And so he started looking at a totally different area, but still part of the Red Sea, and that was the Gulf of Aqaba. He even rented an airplane back, you know, during this time, in the late 70s, um, Israel had control of the Sinai Peninsula. So he rented an airplane from a lot and flew down the coast. And, you know, there was no Google Earth back then. So he's looking out the window, looking uh, visually to see what he could find. And he saw the Nueva Beach, this huge uh, flat area that had enough room for one to two million people. Again, this larger miracle we're talking about. Um, not a small group of Israelites uh, migrating out of Egypt, but a large group. And it, he thought that would be the best location. So he decided to drive down there and check it out and go scuba diving. Um, and so his some of his uh, exploits or adventures are written up in a book called Treasures of the Lost Races, which was published back in 1982. So kind of before he was famous or infamous, uh, this book mentions his name. And this author, Renny Norbergen, actually went with Ron to Nueva. And he mentions in this book, not only about the Nueva Red Sea crossing being uh, a good candidate for that, but they, they mentioned uh, that then Jebel Laws could be the best candidate uh, for Mount Sinai. And of course, that's in Northwest Arabia. Uh, and so, you know, this was not a totally new thinking. You know, there were, there were some scholars back in the 1800s uh, and uh, into the early 1900s that were looking at mountains in Saudi Arabia and even in Jordan. Um, you know, there's, there's like a dozen proposed Mount Sinai sites, but there were people looking in uh, S uh, Saudi Arabia for Mount Sinai. And the reason being is because these people were associated Sinai with Midian. Now, if you look at the text, you know, the land of Midian is where Moses fled to. After he had killed the Egyptian, it said he, you know, he fled Pharaoh because Pharaoh wanted to kill him. And so he, he went and dwelt in the land of Midian for 40 years. Now, all the archaeological evidence uh, points to this being Northwest Arabia. So on this eastern side of the Gulf of Aqaba, and even modern maps today, I, I got this one in uh, in uh, Tabuk, the, the, the province capital, and, and it still uses the name Midian or Midian, you know, the form of the name. And uh, it shows that, that like this is the mountains of Midian. Um, this is a, a Saudi map. And here's another one having Midian listed along the coast down there. Uh, near Sharma, again, these, this coastal area along the Red Sea. Um, and you look at biblical maps, most Bible maps will place Midian correctly in Northwest Arabia there. Uh, and then because of the archaeology, like, uh, now it, it is difficult to uh, associate pottery with a certain ethnic group, but um, you do have this painted ware that's called, that a lot of it was produced in one of this these archaeological sites called Kurira there in Northwest Arabia, one of these sites uh, in the land of Midian. I was producing this special painted pottery that spread out uh, up into Israel and Jordan. Um, but you don't find any of it down near the traditional Mount Sinai site. There's a lack of evidence of a, a thriving society in the Sinai Peninsula, yet where the land of Midian is at, you have these communities dwelling around the oasis. And we're going to look at a couple and so this is where Moses would have fled to. You know, he lived in the land of Midian outside of the uh, area of influence for the uh, for Pharaoh in the land of Egypt. Uh, so here is the route we would say Moses would have fled along. And that comes into play later when we talk about the Exodus route. Uh, because uh, once we figure out where Sinai is and realize that God calls the Israelites to come worship him at the mountain, Moses, and he tells Moses, go bring the Israelites here. They're going to flee Egypt on the same route that Moses did until God tells them to change direction, and they end up at the Red Sea. Uh, so this route, uh, just remember this, they, they cross the Sinai Peninsula, and you end up in Northwest Arabia. Um, and it's an ancient trade route. Uh, here's a good map showing kind of the influence and the control, the area, like the dark red is where Egypt had uh, forts and mines and you know, cities and towns. Uh, and then the lighter red is just like the desert areas that they had influence in and um, and you could say maybe we controlled those areas, but you notice that the whole Sinai Peninsula uh, was under their influence and control because they had a number of mines 
especially at Sarabit al Qaidim. Well, uh, and I've been there, and that's uh, a copper turquoise mining area uh, over many dynasties, uh, even up to the after the Exodus into the 19th dynasty and later. Um, and it's what's really interesting. A couple of years ago, uh, 2010, I think it was, they discovered the cartouche. The only uh, the cartouche is the royal name of a pharaoh in a it's kind of in a circle, it's like his signature. And so they found the cartouche of Ramses the third over here in Tama, and that's an oasis on the kind of the outskirts of Midian. Um, and this cartouche is uh, the same one is used at Timna, at the tip of the Gulf of Aqaba, right near, it's in Israel, this site. Um, it's a copper mining site. And then the same cartouche is found on the western side over there at the start of the trade route there um, on the western side of the Sinai Peninsula. And so it kind of marks during the 19th dynasty uh, this trade route that people would go along to trade goods between the Arabian Peninsula and the land of Egypt. And so it kind of marks the same route that Moses would have fled along. You know, he fled part of it to go down to Midian there. Uh, and I actually um, last month went and finally for the first time saw this cartouche. Uh, we, were, uh, we went way out in the desert there just south of Tabuk, and we had a local guide. And at first he couldn't find it, and finally uh, he spotted it, and we were able to uh, document this uh, Ramsey the third cartouche. Now this is after the Exodus, but again it shows that the the pharaohs had marked the spot, and they were still using the trade route even past the Exodus. Um, so we're looking at this. This is a satellite image um, showing the Sinai Peninsula, where the traditional Sinai is located uh, from Mount Sinai. Um, the Gulf of Aqaba, the main Red Sea down here, uh, and then this northwest Saudi Arabian area that everyone agrees is. Uh, Midian, and it's not just all desert out there. You know, everyone when you think of Saudi Arabia, you think of the empty corridor with this huge sand dunes and you know hot desert temperatures. But uh, Northwest Arabia is a mountainous area uh, with many oases and valleys. Um, and this is Albada, the traditional home of Moses. And on my first trip there in 2016, uh, we visited a farmer, and he showed us his farm. And he's growing alfalfa, and he's pumping water. Um, this water, he said he could dig a well and go down like 10 feet, I think it was, um, and pull out the water. And he was filling up these holding tanks. with You can see the water coming out there from his pump. And it was a lot of water. Um, and so the water table there is pretty high because of the drainage system into Alberta. Um, and so this is not just a modern thing. You know, the ancient writings, uh, historical writings of this region mention a big oasis, much bigger than it was today. Uh, and so... The tradition has Jethro living at this town. It was one of the best places to be in Midian. And uh, you could say that, um, here's a, a quote uh, from a scholar talking about how the land of Midian became the city of Midian during the classical period, so the Greeks. Um, and that name was transferred to the town of Albada, which, you know, which we now call Albada. And so that name has never really been lost. So we can really pinpoint Midian to that Northwest area of Saudi Arabia. Um, and this is where you get the, the traditions of the cave of Jethro, which you saw on, on our tour, uh, which are Nabataean caves. But at the same time, it shows this, um, the locals attaching the biblical stories of the Exodus to this area of the world, not the Sinai Peninsula, but to northwest Saudi Arabia. Um, here's a quote from the book of Exodus talking about how Moses, you know, when he fled Pharaoh, he went and dwelled at a well. Um, remember the famous scene in uh, the Ten Commandments movie? Charlton Heston oh, yeah. goes to a well there. <laughs> He's fighting the Amalekites, I think. <clears throat> and uh, Jethro's daughters, you know, have their sheep there. Uh, well, there's a traditional well of Moses. Um, I don't have any photos in this presentation, but when you go there, there's a, there's a big hole in the ground. And uh, you can see the area where, you know, since at least the Islamic, you know, the Middle, Middle Ages, uh, they would associate this well as uh, being the well of Moses, and the archaeology uh, from that region show that they were using that well at least as far back as the Nabataean, if not before, so like the time of Christ. Uh, but whether it's that well or one nearby, the whole point is that you know that area was where uh, the Midianites lived, and Albada was one of the biggest oasis in the land of Midian. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And, you know, they'll show ancient maps of where Midian was, you know, and these maps go back 2000 years. It places it uh, in Northwest Saudi Arabia. So there is that. Uh, but it, in addition, I, I think just from like a, a common sense perspective, when I look at the Sinai Peninsula, it seems to me that it's 
not far enough from the reach of Pharaoh. Like if if the Bible story happened, and if these this large group of people that is a nation of people escaped out of the hands of Pharaoh and, and the most mighty empire in the world in that time, it would seem to me that the Sinai Peninsula just isn't that far away. Um, if I were running, I mean, it, it just wouldn't make sense in my opinion, to be in the Sinai Peninsula, I would want to get farther away, you know. So, so I think there's just sort of that common sense side of things that makes me want to push Midian to a place where the Israelites could have some safety and security. And you make a very good point. In fact, we're going to look at a couple of key verses in the book of Exodus where during the, their journey, when they leave Sinai, or they leave Goshen, I should say, on the day after Passover, it says when they get to the Red Sea, why have you taken us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? That was a common theme that they would always accuse Moses of taking them out of Egypt to this land of, you know, of, you know, leeks and onions and fish and whatever else they're, you know, eating there. And now they had to eat manna and uh, in the desert. Well, if you look at the influence of the Egyptian Empire, that like that one map that had all the red on, uh, it, it does seem like that traditional site of Mount Sinai is a little too close for, you know, <laughs> for the Israelites <laughs> to not be bothered by any of the Egyptian um, uh, people uh, or army. But if you also think about the Red Sea crossing being um, outside of the, the land of Egypt, uh, then it fits perfectly the Nueva site because, you know, there are th those verses where the, the Hebrews, the Israelites are saying, why did you take us into the wilderness? <laughs> And they're at the Red Sea crossing, you know, accusing Moses. And they say, he took us out of the land of Egypt, you know, out of Egypt. Um, I always wondered for those, you know, we do have a graphic, um, this graphic uh, showing uh, this eastern side of the land of Egypt. Now, those are the traditional, kind of the more traditional sites there that you had starred, correct? That's where, yes. at the and, tip and of the Gulf of Suez. Correct. I just, just to help everyone's geography, like I know it's difficult when you mention all these names, you don't visit this a lot. Um, so this is the Middle East here, and you have Egypt. This is Lower Egypt up there. Um, and then you have the, the two arms of the end of the, Gulf, the Red Sea. So you have the Gulf of Suez and the Gulf of Aqaba, you know, both considered part of the Red Sea. And then in the middle is this uh, triangular piece of land, and today it's called the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, and the traditional Mount Sinai is down here in the southern mountains, uh, and then in the same area, as we mentioned, there's a, a lot of mining activity by the pharaohs in Serbid al Um And then you have the ancient roads going across near the coast from Egypt to Canaan in, up into the you know, Fertile Crescent, uh, you know, Mesopotamia and the Hittites and, and, the, and Turkey. And so it was a very important route. But along that route, the pharaohs had a lot of, of uh, fortresses and they guarded that because obviously that's the easy way for invaders to come in uh, to the land of Egypt was – through this land bridge kind of from Canaan all the way down to Egypt. And so that way of Horus, which is, you know, the way of Horus, uh, Horus being one of their gods, uh, is called the, uh, the way of the Philistines in the book of Exodus. This road um, is a, a path that God said, do not travel along. And so we have, a, it's the fastest way though, to get to Palestine, to get to um, the, the promised land, is just take the road. But, but he said he took them another way to the Red Sea via the, the wilderness of the Red Sea. So you have these two paths out of Egypt, and we, uh, we'll talk about that briefly. But this kind of shows you how, because of all this confusion, you'll, you'll see this map like this in the back of your Bibles. It has all these different proposed routes um, for uh, the Exodus and, and different proposed Mount Sinai's and different proposed uh, Red Sea crossings. And so the next slide, which uh, you were talking about, is this one that has these stars, and they kind of um, illustrate, or they show the different proposed Red Sea crossing sites that uh, a lot of scholars will say uh, it happened. And it's always near Egypt, yet the Bible talks about when they were at the Red Sea, let's say this was the Red Sea crossing, like one of these sites here, they're talking about why had you take us out of Egypt? And, and it, it makes zero sense for the Israelites to be saying that, especially the, the, the main view right now where the Israelites crossed that you see in Hoffmeyer's writings and David Roll's, is this star way up there close to the Mediterranean Sea. And, and I don't have a detailed, in their books, they have like a detailed view showing like where they think the path was and it's going around some marshes and lakes. Um, they say that's the wilderness and they're outside of Egypt. Um, but 
uh, they have to get through a bunch of fortresses and path o- and cross over a canal. Um, I, why would Pharaoh send a big army after the Israelites if the Israelites have not even passed over the border yeah. and, and left the country of Egypt? He, he shouldn't be scared. He has all these forts guarding his uh, eastern frontier and this, uh, this entrance from Canaan. Uh, he had his army stationed. There was a big area. Uh, I think it's – I might be mispronouncing the site, but I think it's called Chukku. Uh, it's T-J-E-K-U, Jakku, or something like that. Anyway, it was a big staging area for the Egyptian army. Uh, they found the um, the ovens where they baked all the bread and had the supplies for uh, the army and the chariot, uh, like horse stalls for the chariots. Um, and so the Israelites are coming through that area. He didn't have to get his army ready and go after them. They haven't even left Egypt. <laughs> but, but the biblical account says they were outside of Egypt and Pharaoh had to go after them. Um and so it makes zero sense that any of these sites, I'll, we'll briefly go through these. Um, so that first site up there, we just talked about, here's a closer view. Um, you know, this is the modern satellite image. So uh, in ancient times, uh, the, uh, the Mediterranean Sea was more inland um, and, uh, you know, the coastal line was different. And so I don't, I should have grabbed one of the graphics from their um, theory, with one of their books. So it's kind of hard to understand what they're saying, but this is the general area that they're saying, uh, like Hoffmeyer and, and David Roll, uh, the Red Six one is uh, Ismailia, and I'll show another view of that one in a bit. But what's interesting is uh, Lake Timza, which is right there, uh, and the city of Ismailia is right there. Nearby, this is where almost everyone agrees is Sukkot, the first camping site of the Exodus. Those who say uh, the Red Sea crossing is somewhere along here, they all agree that Sukkot is here. Ron Wyatt, uh, David, uh, Dr. Glenn Fritz, uh, Dr. Leonard Moeller, and those who have Nueva as the Red Sea crossing, they all have Sukkot right there. So that's kind of like the general, like when the Israelites left their homes in Goshen on Passover, and then they end up, they said the next time they camp or set up to sleep is at Sukkot when they had palm branches. So it must have been a big oasis, a lot of water. And that's what you find today. Uh, this marshy area. And so everyone agrees that that, that's kind of like the starting point where all the Israelites are at before they head out into the wilderness. So this is, but from there, that's where everyone changes. (laughs) So, because most people now will say they went north to the way of the Philistines, but God told them not to go that way. Uh, He said they went to the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And I have a graphic coming up that will show the two ways out of Egypt and why the Israelites, we, you know, believe they took the way of the wilderness uh, across the wilderness of the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, and so anyways, here's the other graphic uh, or the other site. That's for, we're kind of going from north to south of these proposed locations. This is the Bitter Lake. Um, but the, the strange thing is most people don't read the historical record about this region. And this was not even a lake uh, up until the time of the Suez Canal being built. And it, the Suez Canal filled this in. This was a, a, a dry basin. Maybe during some rainstorms it would get all muddy. But it was not uh, a lake, and so people wrote about it just being a basin. And then when they built the Suez Canal, you know, two three hundred years ago, this filled in with water. Now you have this um, a, a big. There's two lakes there, the Greater and Lesser Bitter Lakes, uh, and that was. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that the presence of God just entered your studio. <laughs> You know what? Um, I guess you are a man who has ascended Mount Sinai and lived to talk about it. You'll have to. That's so startling me. I thought it was a one-time thing. I should unplug that. Yeah. Now the mist. I don't know what that looks like, but (laughs) leave that in the. (laughs) Where's my friend? It it looks like ancient incense, or either that, or like the building is on fire. One of the two. Yeah. We're fighting the fire. (laughs) Yeah. So real quick, Andrew, Uh, with these images you're showing us one of the things that i notice is this is a marshy area and like we talked about when we began that's why some kind of dumb down scale down the biblical miracle because this isn't as big of a deal to to cross uh and and i know you said that this this at one point wasn't a marshy area but even like north of that but the other ones yeah some of that stuff like it's not as big of a miracle um, so not only are they not really fully leaving Egypt if you take the traditional location, but for some of these traditional crossing sites, it's like they, they walked across a marsh. It, it doesn't have, you know, the 1956 Ten Commandments Charlton Heston scale to it. 
Well, the strange thing is, like those who say, well, this is the Red Sea crossing, number one, how are they blocked in? You know, it talks about, like in Josephus, that yeah. they're surrounded by mountains. Um, or like even in um, you know, the Bible, Exodus saying that they were entangled in the wilderness. How are you lost here or entangled in anything? If you drive this area today, that's a flat, mainly um, uh, desert area. Uh, and you and like if let's say the Bitter Lakes was there instead of just being a basin for, like for this proposed site, uh, why? How are you stuck? You just go around the lake. <laughs> There's nothing blocking you in. It's just this, you know. It just it makes zero sense for them to uh, be scared. God part of the swampy marsh. Realize. Yeah, and they could just gone to the north or south to get around it. You know, <laughs> it's not like they're stuck there. Um, and and then of course moving down south, another proposed. It's more of a classical view because it's one of the the longest proposed views. Uh, or the oldest, I should say, is that was the tip of the Suez Gulf. Um, and so in somewhere in this area, there's a couple sites people have proposed. But um, and, and I have some friends who believe that, like they accept this route, uh, but they have Mount Sinai in Arabia. So they have a hybrid view. Um, and I like to see more of their uh, one guy is getting his dissertation uh, on some of this, I believe. So I like to see more uh, like their understanding on it. Uh, personally, I still go with Nueva and I'll, as we'll see why soon. Uh, but anyways. There are, you know, good people who believe each one of these, but I just don't think it's going to fit this big miraculous view to have the crossing that close to Egypt to still be in the land of Egypt and no way you're stuck here. Um, and so here's just, I, I took this photo. It's actually two photos combined. I took it from the airplane. I had a flight from Cairo down to the tip of the Sinai Peninsula, Sharm el Sheikh, and I was, just happened to be on a window seat on that flight. I looked out and I could see this traditional view. You can see the Suez Canal starting up there. Uh, and then this is uh, Suez, uh, but right here, this area where the red arrows at, and maybe right there, those are a couple sites that people have proposed that the Israelites would have crossed. And they say, well, there's a mountain right here, and so they kind of, if they got down this area, they would have been stuck. You know, from a high level, let's say maybe 1800s map, you could consider that. I've driven this. There's a road right there you can drive. Okay. Uh, even from this, you can kind of see uh, from the airplane view. It's kind of hard, though, but basically there's like a mile wide. Maybe I've made it not a mile, but there's a wide enough uh, flat area there that you can easily walk and go around the mountain <laughs> and, and, like, you know, play, uh, you know, what do you call it? Like ring around the rosy with the, the Pharaoh's <laughs> army, but you're not stuck. There's no, there's no mountain like at Nueva going right to the beach and making it so you can't go anywhere and have Pharaoh's army behind you blocking you in. It just so this site itself doesn't work. Um, and uh, I don't, let me see. This verse here talks. Yeah, here we go. So now we're talking about the two ways out of Egypt, the way of the Philistines, which God says he did not lead them by. Yet all these people say they went up that way, roll in uh, uh, Hofmeyer's route. And that's usually the route you see in, in the Bible today. Um, and then it says, though, that he led them the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And so, now, again, I'm a visual person, so I got to see that on a map. So we're looking again. This is kind of a, a different view because you're looking east towards Israel over there, the Dead Sea. Here's the Gulf of Aqaba, land of Midian, and Saudi Arabia. And then here's the Suez Gulf, and down that's Goshen down there, the land of Egypt. <laughs> and so along this eastern border, where I kind of put those red dots, uh, they had canals and forts, and they had to control that eastern frontier because they didn't want uh, people just coming in and, you know, uh, taking over their land. Armies are just migrants. I would think uh, so. So – yeah, I mean, kind of like yeah, everyone wants a border wall in the south, <laughs> along the, the southern part of the U.S. border. Well, they were concerned about their border, too, back in the ancient Egyptian times. And so they had forts there uh, and canals as barriers. Um, so there's two main ways out of Egypt during uh, this uh, time period. The Green Arrow, that's what we would call the way of the Philistines. Now, that's the shortest way to get to Israel. Uh, the Isra the uh, Egyptians in their literature, they call it the way of Horus. Um, and during the Greeks, they call it the uh, Via Mara, I think, the way of the sea, a coastal route. But the Egyptians had all these forts built along that route. Um, and so the next way out is kind of where we're talking about Lake Timza, the proposed Sukkoth uh, camping site, the very first place the Israelites encamped and made booths out of palm branches and you know, these temporary dwellings. That's the starting point. And it says that God took them that way, the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And so to understand why would you call it, like, where's the wilderness of the Red Sea? That is that whole area out there, what we call today the Sinai Peninsula. And it's between the two branches of the Red Sea. 
Um, here's a map I made kind of illustrating the route we're proposing that you know, this is from Ron Wyatt um, and then others have picked up on it and done more research like Dr. Glenn Fritz, Leonard Moeller. And so anyways, I think um, before I get to that verse, I thought I had a slide about uh, kind of illustrating the route, but I guess that was all I had. Anyways, uh, So if you look at the biblical account, it's after they leave Egypt that God then tells them to change direction. Um, and it says, you know, and that change of direction gets them at the Red Sea. But this only happens after they left Egypt, because when they're at the Red Sea crossing, the Israelites are complaining that you've taken us out of Egypt. You know, they're, they're accusing Moses to die in the wilderness. Um, and so along this proposed route that we're talking about, this ancient trade route from Egypt to Saudi Arabia that Moses fled and that the, you know, Ramses III, his men marked, um, this route, you it would have taken the Israelites all the way to Midian. They would just, you know, it's like a natural highway. You know, people use it all the time. But right before they would get to Midian, God said, change your direction. It's and really Moses, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Andrew, but Moses actually had been there. Yeah, so he would have known how to get to Midian. Yeah. And it would make sense that they would have been traveling. Uh, obviously, Moses didn't go through the parted sea when he fled Egypt the first time. So he would have went yeah. the way that was natural to him to get back to, to Mount yeah. Sinai where God told him and, to and go. That was probably why, exactly. And that's probably why God had to tell him, like, change direction. Moses is thinking, why? Like, because the natural way, like, I, like I've been on this route to and from Midian. Um, and why are we changing direction? You know, they're following the cloud, but God had to tell them to change direction. Otherwise, they would just naturally keep continuing around the Gulf, following this, uh, you can call it modern highway, you know, this, this trade route that's well known. Uh, but he said change direction. Now, the interesting thing is uh, there's only one area along this Gulf of Aqaba Red Sea uh, body of water that has a big enough beach that has one way onto it that comes off of this ancient trade route where you have to change direction to get to. And that one beach is called today Nueva. And so that's why, uh, you, I mean, there's other beaches along the Gulf, but this one here has the the, has everything matching. There's not like uh, some of that matches, but other stuff we have to like uh, taught, you know, figure out how, how it would work. You know, every point from the biblical record and the, what the historians have wrote later on about the Red Sea crossing, like Josephus, fits at Nueva. Um, we're going to quickly go through some of that. Uh, but first, the biblical account talks about them being lost in the wilderness or shut in. A wandering in the land, wilderness that shut you in. Um, I've seen some really interesting um, theories or uh, for the traditional list, those who say it's up by those lakes, uh, like David Roll and um, uh, uh, Dr. Hoffmeyer. Uh, uh, David is also, I should say, you know, he's a doctor too, an Egyptologist. Uh, so these guys, uh, even with all their degrees, they have to figure out how this fits in their path. And, and I've been driving, I uh, drove that area up there, and you have to wonder, how are you lost in the wilderness um, how you shut in uh, when you're just you just left Goshen, you know, maybe you know, 30 miles away or less, um, and you're still within, you haven't crossed over the border canals or the border forts. And so Pharaoh has no reason to, you know, be concerned that you're going to escape. His army's right there. So uh, again, it, this verse is key, and it doesn't fit the geology or the geography of that area of um, the eastern side of the land of Egypt, the traditional Red Sea crossing sites. But if you look at this mountainous area by the coast of the Gulf of Aqaba, there's this one, they call it a wadi in Arabic, which is a valley system or canyon. Uh, it's a natural roadway that you could use to march through and walk through. So there's this one canyon system that leads off of that trade route. It ends up at a huge beach called Nueva. Uh, and this is a modern name for this as, as Wadi Watir. Um, now, here's a quote from Josephus, and he talks about how the Israelites, the Hebrews, were driven into, uh, you know, they, they came into this area because, you know, God told them to change direction, and they ended up at this narrow area. Uh, there is nothing like this along the, the lakes um, and the traditional sites uh, where you're stuck. And so here is a satellite view of the Nueva Beach. And you can even visually see that canyon system that goes into the interior of the Sinai Peninsula to the traditional, or I should say, to the trade route that goes to Midian in the Arabia. And they're um, hemmed in at that location, correct? By the by, the mountains. They're if they get there, 
you can see in, how yeah. that fits you with are, how they would be hemmed you, in. And, and you even see the path the 3D, that they took to get it, to uh, get to the beach as well. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. We, I think, in fact, on your tour that you were on, we drove part of it. Like we went down into it and you can see you're in this Canyon system. Uh, this is a photo I think Ron took is really good view up on one of the side uh, of the Canyon. But you're looking out, you can kind of see it. I, I can see it better probably on my end, but you can see the mountains of, uh, uh, Williams of sure, but in, in uh, Midian, uh, in Northwest Arabia over there. And that's the Gulf of Aqaba. So this Canyon system leads to this huge beach and you can see how you're hemmed in. And Josephus talks about how like the mountains to the south blocked them. Um, in fact, the whole area you're blocked. Now, I've seen a couple of people who, uh, you know, again, uh, everyone has their view of where the Red Sea ha crossing happened. And one individual uh, was saying that, oh, well, you're not really hemmed in here because there's these roads you can take out. Uh, in fact, we drove the southern road to, from St. Catherine on your tour coming in. Well, it's funny that these guys will say that, but they won't go to like on the ground here and talk to the locals and do some historical research uh, uh, find out that all these roads were mainly built by the Israelis in the 70s. And they say before that, the only way on to here that you could like take a road in was the Wadi Watir. And these other ones were um, just like narrow gorges and canyons uh, they didn't use for anything. Um, and even the road today going along the coast, you'll see it on some maps that, that there's a road, uh, it's a modern road that goes from Nueva all the way up to the Israeli um, border, the modern border at Taba and a lot. And, and when you drive that road, I've driven it many times and taken a lot of photographs, but that road is cut into the mountainside. You know, without that cutting and, and taking away the mountain, that mountain would have gone right into the sea and blocked any way north. So you're literally stuck here unless you would have go back the way you came. But the Israelites couldn't because the, the, the uh, Egyptian army was right behind them. Um, and so uh, the modern roads are, don't tell the true story. But So in ancient times, Wadi Watir was the only way onto this beach. It's kind of a I like that the the red line there. Here I'm standing in the canyon. Now some people propose that, that uh, Paihi Harath. Uh, I hope I said that right. Uh, the the, um, the name that uh, that Moses wrote down for the Israelites coming down and camping in front of. They say that because it means the mouth of a, of a gorges or canyon um, is one proposed uh, meaning for that Hebrew word. That that refers to Wadi Watir, um, and you can see this canyon system. It's a, it's a very uh, 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 pronounced or um, visual thing you see there. Like you can't miss it. It's on a small canyon. Now back to Josephus. Here is his quote about the mountains terminating at the sea. Now show me any mountain up by those lakes. It's all flat. It's, it's marshland or sand dunes or a farmland. Um, there's no mountains terminating at the sea at those uh, traditional Red Sea crossing sites. Now, they're um, at the tip of the Gulf of uh, Suez. We talked about one of those classical sites, but even that mountain doesn't terminate at the sea. There's a wide, and I've driven there, and there's a modern road. Uh, we stopped and filmed it. Uh, there's a wide enough part where it's, I don't know if it's a mile or a little less than a mile wide, but it's big enough that masses of people could walk around that mountain. Uh, so, uh, again, Nueva, you don't have that. Nueva, it, it, it terminates. All the, the mountains go right to the sea, and you're stuck there. Uh, here's an, again the same map, but kind of again illustrating what Josephus wrote. Now he was fifty years after the Exodus. That that beach is large enough we to hold like a lot of people. I mean, you, from the picture, it looks like a small beach. That's a huge beach oh, right there that can tiny, easily yeah. accommodate two, three million Israelites. Yeah, here's I have a photo. We're down at the southern end where Ron White was scuba diving, looking for chariot wheels and such. At that southern end. You can see how massive, like these are the trees. And so, and these are the mountains. It's massive. It's uh, very impressive when you're there. You can see like a wall. These mountains are hemming you in. You have the Red Sea in front of you. And one way that you came in on the Wadi Watir, that now the Egyptian army is coming in after you. Um, and so, no, it's a, I forget how many thousands of acres are there. Uh, I once calculated, and I don't want to say it because I'll probably get it wrong. But uh, you know, on Google Earth, like if you have the application, you can, um, It'll give you the acreage if you want. You can like draw a polygon, and I want to say it was like ten thousand acres, but it was a lot. Yeah, it's, so it's, um, it's big. We, yeah, we've gotten some uh, really nice uh, views. Actually, it's kind of hard in this projector to see, but wow. at a certain time of the year, you can be in Saudi Arabia, and you can actually get the uh, photo with the sun going down between the canyons in Wadi Watir. Wow, so kind of a cool shot. 
Uh, here's one from a boat where we actually take some of our t- time on our tours. We take people out on the boat, a sunset, and you look. You're actually taking, you know, you're not too far off the beach, but you're on these little fishing boats that are rocking back and forth, and you're looking back and you can see the sun set in between that canyon. And it's very similar view um, of when the Israelites were there because we know it happened at night that the Red Sea crossing occurred. Uh, so the sun set, and they were, you know, scared to death that they're stuck here with the Egyptian army coming. Um, now. You know, this is Hollywood, but it kind of, for me, I'm very visual, like, you know, just imagining this big miracle happening. Um, here's an animated GIF I found online. I don't know who did it. Is that um, AI but, uh, uh, that, that made that? No, this was actually before that became popular. Okay. This might be a clip from one of the movies, uh, or someone just made it, um, like, the hard way back. You know, this was like five or six years ago, I think. I've but seen anyway, some funny AI yeah, he, pictures of Moses and the Israelites <laughs> recently. Doing selfies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I see. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, thinking about, you know, what if they had cell phones back then? <laughs> they wouldn't have gotten lost, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, if you think about Nueva versus the marshlands, and we talked about this big miracle versus a small miracle uh, and just wading through the marshes. Well, this is kind of what it would be like for Nueva, uh, because Nueva is 850 meters deep in the middle, but much deeper on both sides, especially the south side of Nueva. Uh, so there's this walkable path, that I call it. Um, and it's, not a, it's not an underwater cliff. You don't need rappelling rope to get down. And it's the only place in the, in the Gulf of Aqaba we have these large beaches to, uh, you know, for the Israelites to camp on, and then a walkable path underground, under the water. Uh, to walk when the water is removed. And, and I but, think you know, this is, is an deep. important point because the, uh, this to me is, is one of the biggest evidences. You've got a way that they can cross and, and you don't have that in yes. other locations. Yeah, and I have a graphic coming up uh, shortly that will uh, compare, especially for the Gulf of Aqaba. Like there's, there's no other place. Like in, let's say there were, there were other be- there are other beaches along the Gulf but you don't have a way off the, the trade route to get to it. Or when you, if you take the water out from in front of where you're at, it's a cliff. Like you take the water, what are you going to do? Like climb down the cliff with your children <laughs> and your flocks and your sheep. And, uh, you can't. But this one, everything fits. I mean, there's not like a, a one big issue. The only issue you could say is that it's deep. It's 850 meters in the middle. But to me, because it was a mighty miracle that the Bible describes, it talks about the waters of the deep. God can easily just say the word, and you know, if He can create the world by just pronouncing something, uh, He can split the sea. So to me, it's not a problem. And, and this uh, red arrow here on this new slide I just put up, it shows where they went from Nueva. You can see how big that beach is. You know, it has thousands of acres. As you come over here to the Saudi Arabian side, where we take uh, tours to, and as you saw too on your tour, that this is a mu- it's a much bigger beach area. Um, so you can't just you have to find a, a Red Sea crossing where when they left the this side and they go over, they don't hit a bunch of mountains. Like you can't like come up and oh, there's no place for us to go. We have to like mountain climb. But no, the Saudi side is a perfect uh, place to receive the Israelites, so to say. You know that they come out of the the sea and they end up here. And it says you know in Exodus chapter 15 that they had a big you know party basically. You know they dance and Miriam was singing and um, everyone was so, you know happy and excited and the bodies of the Egyptian army was floating on the coast there. Um, so you do have even the Saudi side fitting for this uh, Red Sea crossing route. You know, to me, that There's underwater view, pathway is really a that that's a big evidence there. You know, like yeah, let me uh, the, jump. The, the, like yeah, would that me. be a coincidence that along that whole stretch of the Gulf of Aqaba, there's nowhere where they could have crossed except for Nueva, and you could even picture the way Wadi Watir empties out onto the beach. That's a place where the pillar, pillar of fire could have easily withheld Pharaoh's army because they would have all been log jammed in, the, in Wadi Watir. Yeah, in fact, yeah, that's the key point of the story. Uh, you, know, we're, you know, there's a lot of details in the Exodus account, but uh, we did, uh, I'm glad you brought that up because it talks about the pillar of fire that was usually in front of the Israelites, this cloudy pillar at day and a fire by night uh, that guided them where to go, like their GPS compass. Uh, it moved, you know, it was a miracle. So was, you see this pillar and it moves to, it goes behind the Israelites and separates them from the Egyptian army to keep the two away from each other while the Israelites are escaping through the Red Sea crossing. Uh, and so, yeah, that pillar could have blocked them right in and, and you know, stopped the, uh, uh, the Egyptians at that choke point. 
uh, Wadi Wittier. Now, you, you mentioned that the, about the underwater path. Now, uh, up until recently, the best uh, bathymetric map of the uh, made of this area, now bathymetric map is uh, t like underwater topography uh, showing the, the uh, landscape under the water. Uh, but the best map was made by the Israelis in the 1970s. Uh, you know, in the 1990s, I was in college and I, um, I was really, uh, really into this <laughs> a, a lot. So I actually contacted um, the Israelis and because uh, they someone said um, you should contact this certain doctor. Um, his name is on the map. Um, I forget his name now. Oh, John Hall. He's still alive. Um, and, and I, I, I don't know, if, you know, this was mid nineties. I don't know if there was email back then or not, but I, I faxed him or emailed or whatever. And he actually mailed me like a big tube I got from Israel. I was like, Oh, what's this? I opened it up and for free. He sent me all these charts that he had made with his other colleagues of, um, the Mediterranean and the Gulf of Aqaba. Uh, and now this is online for free. Like they digitized it. But back then I had this big paper map rolled up <laughs> and really special to me because, you know, as a kid or someone in college, you know, this. This Israeli scientist actually mailed me a free map of the Red Sea crossing, you know, and it shows, like you're saying, like Nueva is the only spot. Uh, I'll zoom in to Nueva, but I wanted to show though the rest of the Gulf that like these other places where there could be like a little beach, uh, Dahab, uh, Sharm el Sheikh is another proposed site by um, you know Bob uh, Cornuk in um, um, uh, I forget the guy's name. He runs uh, Bible.ca. Uh, Rudd, um, Steve Rudd. He wrote a, a good book. Now, he believes Sinai is in Arabia, but he puts the, uh, the crossing down by the Straits of the Tehran, which I've been out uh, on, a, on a boat. And you can see, though, there's problems with it. And I'll, I'll show you some charts comparing all these sites that Dr. Glenn Fritz made. And again, Nueva is the only one that has a walkable path, no underwater sea cliffs, um, no issues with the underwater topography. The Israelites and their carts and animals and children can walk only at Nueva. And so here's a close up of Nueva, again, from the Israeli chart. Kind of give you that visual effect of going across the sea there, <laughs> zooming in. Now, as the lines are close together, that means it's a cliff. So over here, uh, it's really steep because that, that's the contour lines. That's how you read the map. The, the, the more spread out they are, uh, that means it's more gentle to slope. Um, again, this is Saudi Arabia. That's Nueva, Egypt over there. Here's a kind of an angled view. All the views you can get. Now, I've overlaid on the Israeli chart this other map. Uh, made by, I think this was a German uh, survey vessel where they did more high, like high resolution uh, sonar scans of the, of the mountain. And from their scans, we can actually look at the, the angle of descent, like the, the ramp they walk down into the water. Um, and uh, it's walkable. It's not an underwater cliff like you have along a lot of the Gulf of Aqaba. Um, and here's a, an, this is actually from a Saudi, a recent Saudi um, survey they did. And they were looking at the fault lines because um, this is a fan. Aqua is part of the uh, uh, Rift Valley, that par that part of the earth where it's ripped open all the way from Ethiopia up to like Sea of Galilee. And so it goes along the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aqaba. And so in there, you know, they've had earthquakes along there. In 1995, Nueva had a really big earthquake. Um, but anyways, their survey shows this walkable path that it's not an underwater cliff there. Uh, now, here's from Dr. Glenn Fritz's books. I do recommend his material. Uh, he studied this a lot, and he shows the angle of uh, ascent and descent and that it's walkable. Uh, you look at the, the degrees here. Going down at 6 degrees. I'm looking at this without my glasses, so uh, 7.4 degrees there. Um, uh, so it, it is a walkable. And then here's the chart I was telling you about where it compares these different okay, areas. Okay, so the top the one on this chart is Nueva. Is Nueva. Okay. You see, it's a gentle slope walk. Yeah. The other two are further down, uh, like Dahab, which is a famous dive area, but it has a little beach there. But it, let's say you can walk it, but you get to the Saudi side, it's like a cliff on these two here. Obviously, the Argonese Ar Deep is really deep. It's like we get how many meters down in the middle. That's why uh, Nueva is just north of there, and then south is a huge deep area. So that's why it's a walkable path. You have between the um, a lot deep north of Nueva and south. Let's go back a couple slides so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, you have these, I'll, I'll just get up here and lecture like this. <laughs> you have this very deep area here. You need a pointer. And you have this deep area here. And in between the two deep areas is this like sill, this little uh, valley that's, that's higher up. You know, it's 850 meters deep, so it's still deep. But at, at Nueva, that's a walkable area. 
all these other ones you can see, like the why it's black because the contour lines are so close, meaning it's a cliff. And that's like here's Hackle right over here, and so right out of Hackle is it just drops off. Um, and then here as you, as you go down, this is that Arganese Deep. I was saying that he drew a uh, that Glenn Fritz was comparing Nueva Arganese Dahab, and then straight to Turan, which is a proposed crossing site. So if we're going to look at uh, so we can briefly talk about that because, you know, that is a crossing site, some have said, uh, for the Gulf of Aqaba. And if you look at when we compare it, there, it's again, it has a huge issue with the underwater topography. You yeah. have to somehow get rid of this. It, it's not uh, too deep. You know, it's, I think, 300 meters or uh, 100 meters. I mean, I don't know if it's 300 feet or 300 meters, but either way, the angle of the descent into that little trough is uh, like scaling a cliff. So and I think people would have charge. to, um, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Pe people would have to realize that the Israelites were not an army. These weren't like Navy SEALs traveling and climbing yeah. up these, you know, up and down these locations. They were elderly so, women, yeah. children, you know, mm -hmm. um, th this was a nation of people. And a lot of them, they, like, the only place they could have crossed is Nueva. It's it, if you're looking yeah, at the Gulf of Aqaba. That's what we're hammering. It's the only place. <laughs> we're showing you. Yeah, we're 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 kind of getting in everyone's head like over and over from the underwater topography, from the above. You know, the aerial photos showing the mountains, the big beach, the one way into the area. Only Nueva fits. Uh, it's not like uh, maybe it doesn't fit or not. No, it fits. This is uh, has a little illustration here. You're, you're blowing up the other kids. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're burning a hole in the theory. <laughs> now here's a great view. So we've been the only group that has been out on boats. Sadly, the Saudis don't allow this anymore. But we've taken tour groups out there on the Saudi side on a boat, and we've done research too, like bringing our equipment. Uh, they always check our bags coming and going because this is a known drug route from Egypt, and so they want to see what we found out in the water. But we've gotten drones out there and underwater sonar and underwater drones too. But this was I flew this one off the boat, and so you're way out there. Um, and you can even see the gradual effect of you know, this is looking over towards Nueva. So this side is um, Saudi Arabia, and you can see, this, see all this coral and how shallow it is. It just gradually goes underwater. It's very walkable. Um, we uh, this was on uh, May, March and May of 2019. So right before the pandemic, uh, we were on this boat. Here's my GPS mark. So we were going all through there. Uh, now, of course, they don't allow you to go too far out to international waters in the Gulf, but. Um, you know, there's some areas like we like our sonar would pick up and show like, oh, that's not walkable. You know, there's a this angle is 47 degree angle. You know, it was like almost a cliff. Um, uh, now, uh, so I'll, I'll jump back to some other things here. I just want to briefly mention, um, besides what we looked at, like geography and the historical writings talking about the mountains surrounding them uh, and the you know the Exodus route following the ancient trade route. Uh, Ron uh, went scuba diving on the Nueva site, and he claimed, I've never seen them, but he claimed to have seen different chariot parts, mainly wheels, uh, that were preserved because of the coral, or he claimed, like in this case, this is a screenshot of uh, one of his videos, that, um, that, that he had found gold, and he, and he said, you know, gold doesn't uh, corrode or decay, and so it still lasts, but he said it was very fragile and thin, so he left it there. Um, a lot of people try to find this again. But sadly, Ron has passed away, so we don't know uh, the exact spot uh, in, uh, off of Nueva. But these are his photographs. So for him, he talked a lot about the chariot wheels out there. Um, I usually don't talk about what I don't, well, I can't see myself. So I, I don't um, dwell on it. You know, it's a possibility. You know, people have attacked these a lot, saying, oh, you're just looking at coral, that, you know, coral would not preserve stuff like that. Like wooden object would decay fast. Other objections are like these are valves from a ship. Uh, the metal, like from recent vessels, the valves would turn things. Um, uh, I do know what you can see in museums. Uh, these are ancient uh, chariots. I, you might have seen these too, and this is in the Cairo Museum. I think we did stop at that museum on our tour. Um, so you can see the style of chariots back then. These are six-spoke wheels. Uh, like This was a four-spoke one. Um, but at any rate, uh, I don't know whether, you know, people do, uh, talk about this a lot. It's a great way to get people to watch your video by saying you found underwater chariot parts. So I just know Ron's story. I don't think he lied. Or maybe he misinterpreted some of the coral, but I do find some of the stuff interesting enough that it got him to keep going, uh, you know, whether he interpreted all the data correctly uh, and whether chariots would have been preserved all these years. You know, that's another question. 
Uh, but we don't, to me, we don't need to find like a perfectly preserved wheel to prove it's the Red Sea crossing. Uh, you can look at ge the geography, the geology, the historical documents. Um, anyways, so that was a little side thing about the chariot parts because everyone always asks that uh, about Nueva. Um, in regards to, and we kind of briefly talked about this, on the Saudi side, this huge beach. You've been and I've been on there. Uh, it's a huge area that the Israelites would have come out of the sea and been here and then started their journey. Again, here's the Saudi beach looking over. You can see Nueva over there in the distance, about eight miles across, nine miles. Um, and then when you're here, you're not stuck. You, know, you can't just be on a beach and then stay there forever. So they went to Mount Sinai. Well, there are two big wadi or valleys that lead off that beach into the interior of Midian. And we've driven both wadis now. One has a, a, a big road that's, on, that's been constructed, the paved road you can drive uh, for the Neom project. Uh, these photos were taken before any of the roads were put in. Um, and so, yeah, I think that uh, covers most of my slides. And so just to sum up, I have two slides summing it up. Um, the first thing I wanted to point out about this whole discussion, comparing this site to the traditional sites up there along the eastern side, you know, the marshlands, uh, that this they're outside of Egypt, literally. Um, Pharaoh didn't have to worry about catching up to them on the other ones, but this one he did because they're outside of Egypt. Uh, and that's exactly what the Israelites said in you know, Exodus chapter 14. They complained to Moses, why do you take us out of Egypt? Um, now, how did they get to that site? Well, it's off the main trade route to Midian. So if your Mount Sinai is near or in the land of Midian, then this is a natural uh, path you would have taken, this trade route to Midian. And now it suddenly makes sense why God said to change direction, and that will take you to the Red Sea or the Gulf of Aqaba. So, you know, this turning back leads you to Nueva, the only part or only beach that allows you to do that off the trade route. Uh, it's surrounded by mountains, just like Josephus talks about. You have zero mountains um, at the, uh, the, uh, the Bitter Lakes, the Timza, and those other places that uh, Dr. Hoffmeyer and Dr. Um, Roll uh, talk about. That's usually in the back of your Bibles. Um, and then just to be clear, Josephus even says the mountains to the south block them. And you, know, you have that in Nueva, that southern area, in the northern area. It's all surrounded by mountains, and both sides go right to the beach. Like you can't get around them. Masses of people couldn't do it. And now, what about the underwater bath uh, bathymetric data? Yeah, um, Nueva is the only spot. It's walkable. Like you get rid of that 800 meters of water, you still have a gradual descent and ascent uh, on the other side. Uh, the other places you don't. Straight to Tehran, you, even though it's, it's not as deep, you do have these cliffs, and you have to somehow get rid of those cliffs. Um, and then on the other side, as we saw from the photographs, there's a large beach to receive the Israelites. And so, again, there's only one spot on the Gulf of Aqaba that fits, and it's Nueva. And, and so that is why uh, our, our focus has been on the research and on um, taking people to see these sites has been Nueva. But we do take people to some of the traditional sites so they can see, like, Sinai and um, Bitter Lake um, crossing sites. But I do recommend if you really want to dive deep into this, uh, if you go to ancientexodus.com, uh, Dr. Glenn Fritz has a couple books out. His dissertation, um, this book is based on his dissertation. Um, and then you have his, his really th new book that's really thick that has th you know, hundreds of photographs. Uh, and I helped him with some of the photographs on this one. Um, uh, but it, and he, there's PDF versions too if you just want to buy the electronic copy. Um, and then if you want a, a lesser scholarly view that's more readable, um, but just as good, I think, is, and this one, it's not in print, but you can find news copies. Sadly, Dr. Muller passed away a number of years ago, but um, I think the PDF you can buy off the, the website that his organization has kept running. Um, and so, yeah, th these are really good. Uh, you know, it's kind of hard sometimes to explain it all. I, I, can sh I showed a couple slides, but um, if you're really into figuring this out, uh, these are really good resources to read along with your Bible that can help explain. Yeah, that's awesome, Andrew. For me, it just kind of all lines up. You've got the historical side of things with where the land of Midian was. You've got uh, the geography of, of the uh, the Red Sea crossing site at Nueva, which, you know, to me is just, it's too much for coincidence. Wh whether or not the chariot parts are there or not, I, I agree with you. I think that's kind of irrelevant. Um, there's also the size of 
the Israelite nation and, you know, how many people it would take to populate the promised land. That would certainly be a lot more than 10 to 20,000 Israelites. Um, I mean, God wiped out that many in, you know, various plagues uh, through the through the time that they were in the wilderness. So, I mean, they, there would have been none left to go, you know, populate the, the promised land there if that were the case. So I, so I think I think you make a good case. And I know that you take people to these locations. So how can somebody join one of your tours? Yeah, I know, you know, people who can travel or can afford it, uh, they want to see the sites. And I, that was me. Uh, I first heard about this. I couldn't go, but so I would watch and read everything I could about it in high school. And then finally, when I could go, uh, I think my first time to Nuevo was in 2000. Um, and I just kept coming back. And then people wanted to, to come on on my trips. I said, okay, let's make this a tour. So that's kind of how that all started. Um, but uh, if they want to join us, uh, we do have tours come up in April, uh, maybe May. But it could, then it could start getting hot. But we definitely have an April date coming up. Uh, and we also do private tours. So if you just want your family or a group of church members, and only your group, we do schedule those in. So those dates aren't listed on our website. You just email us. So go to our website at discoveredsinai.com. And there's a contact page there, and also all the details about the tour and the itinerary and all that. Uh, but we also custom design things if you want to say longer or shorter. We had uh, a couple of ladies come out uh, in October, actually the day the, the Israeli Hamas war started. They crossed over that morning into Saudi, and we did a one-day tour. Usually we do five-day tours out there uh, with a six-day for climbing. But they want to see everything. You know, all they had was one day extra. So I said, ah, I'm in the area. <laughs> so uh this, we drove around really fast and took a lot of pictures uh so that was great but um yeah come uh, join us uh people ask is it safe in saudi arabia right now uh you know our tours we, there's a lot of companies doing tours of israel so we don't usually uh, touch on that um but for egypt and saudi we were we've been doing these tours since september for this year or last year i should say all the way to december so September, October, November, December, I've been in and out of Egypt and Saudi Arabia multiple times. No problems. Everyone there is telling us, you know, please tell everyone to come. It's safe here. Uh, so, again, we've had zero safety issues. And uh, we'd like to show you guys these sites if you want to see it. Yeah, it is it is definitely a major faith builder. And um, I took my 13-year-old son with me last year. He's going to be 15 here in a couple of days, but he was only 13 at the time. And uh you know, it was it was fantastic. I thought the people were really nice. You guys climbed. Did you guys climb like the fastest up to the top? We did. We were you trying to set the record. I, I think we might have. I know. I know. Uh, Keith Johnson yeah, was pretty Moses. impressed. He was eighty, but <laughs> yeah, he called he my son Spider Man. That was his his un, my, my son Jake's unofficial nickname. Uh, so, uh, but God bless you, yeah. Andrew. Thank you yeah. so much, man. And uh, I think a lot of compelling information there. I hope people will consider it, and I guess we'll see you in the next video. Make sure to like and subscribe, everybody. I've already told you about my recent trip to the Middle East and the real Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia, but what you may not know is that you can experience these things for yourself, and it's all made possible through our friends and ministry partners at DiscoveredSinai.com, where Andrew Jones and his team will take you on an adventure of biblical proportions to places like Noah's Ark, the Pyramids of Egypt, the real Mount Sinai and Red Sea Crossing site, the Split Rock of Horeb, Elijah's Cave, Sodom and Gomorrah, and Jerusalem. I can't emphasize enough just how incredible this opportunity is. It will be life-changing for you and your family. And here's the cool part. You can do the whole tour or just book the individual things you'd like to see. And the prices are amazingly reasonable for this all-inclusive spiritual experience. Book your tour today at DiscoveredSinai.com. Hey, there's one more thing I've got to share with you. I want you to know that you know Jesus and that you will one day be resurrected and spend an eternity with him. The Bible says that all those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That all you need to do is confess Jesus with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. So just say this prayer with me right now. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner and I need a savior. I believe that you died for my sins and that you were raised to life three days later. Make me born again in my heart through the power of your Holy Spirit and help me to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer, you are saved. Now go get yourself a Bible so that you can begin to develop godly habits in your life and make sure to join a Bible-believing local church where you can be baptized as an outward symbol of what God just did in your heart. If you don't have a copy of the Bible, send us a message and we'll get one to you. Welcome to the family, friend. Thank you.